Bye, Andy. Morning. Morning. We're just waiting for a few more people to join. Morning, everybody. We're just going to give it a couple more more minutes for um for some more delegates to join. We've had about forty people um sign up, so we'll we'll give it uh, we'll give it another ninety seconds or so, and then we'll and then we'll make a start, and people can join as they as they arrive. If that's okay. Um, I'll maybe maybe wait till it says eight thirty two on my screen. OK, so for those just joining, I'm just giving it another 30 seconds or so because some um, people are still uh, entering the, the event and I'll start in, a, in, in. Well, I'll start now, shall I? 8.32, <laughs> two minutes late. So um, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, bright and early on this Thursday morning for our Hill Dickinson webinar, which we've called Why Let Property Law uh, Ruin a Good Design. So. First of all, just a couple of housekeeping points, if that's OK. The, the webinar is being recorded, so um, it will be shared afterwards. And I hope that's that's OK with, with everybody. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, then you can you can put them into the chat as we go along and we'll we'll try and pick them up. Or alternatively, there'll be a, uh, a section at the end where you can you can come off of mute and um, you can ask your question and, and Mark and I will will answer it at, at, at that point. We will share the slides afterwards as well. Um, we'll share also the recording, I think. And um, I've also got a sort of short checklist um, that summarises some of the material which we'll share with you as well. So the subject today is, is uh, why let property law ruin a good design? And what we're going to talk about is how you identify and deal with development constraints on NHS capital projects. And I think the the uh, the idea behind this this session really comes from uh, trusts and, and, and other developers working in the sector, moving forward with schemes on a on a design or a red line drawing, which perhaps doesn't always take into account the the underlying legal position on on the site. So we need to make sure that at the start of any project, we're giving the architects and the design team um, an accurate footprint to develop to. And we'll talk a bit more about that at, during the seminar. So first of all, looking at the, um, the agenda. So we'll have a look at the objectives of the session. Um, I'll then very briefly touch on uh, a state code and the new hospital programme requirements for title overview. A and then we'll get into a bit of detail about the the various legal issues which go to determine the extent of your your development site. So we'll look at tenure. We'll talk about covenants, particularly restrictive covenants. We'll talk about easements, uh, access to the development site, mines and minerals. And then last of all, we've got um, Mark Kidd, who's who's one of the um, leading experts on rights to light, rights to light surveyor. And he's going to delve into a little bit more detail on rights to light and also daylight sunlight analysis, which can be significant constraints on development projects. And we're really pleased to have Mark with us. So all of these things you know, could be topics in themselves. The idea of today's session is to provide a bit of an overview um, by way of a sort of breakfast CPD. So we'll, we'll be touching on them, but not perhaps diving into, into a huge amount of detail on each. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm pleased to see so many names I recognise in the uh, in in the list. Um, so welcome to everyone who, who who I know already. But for those who who don't know who who Dickinson are, we're we're an international commercial law firm. We've got about a thousand people across the business, and healthcare is about one third of the firm. So it's a it's a large part of the the, the business here. We've got a, a health real estate team of ten lawyers. 
and that's that's led by me, James Atkins, um, but also my partners, Andrea Proudlock and Emma Brecknock, who, who some of you may know. And the team work on a range of, of NHS and, and private sector health projects across the country. And that that ranges from from very simple small projects to to large and, and complex. So between us, we've got quite a bit of experience of dealing with NHS developments and the kind of development constraints that might arise on uh, projects. So let's just have a look at the objectives of the session. So it, what we're trying to do is to, to, to give delegates a, a better understanding of the kind of property law issue. So this is a, from my perspective, it's a, it's a property law session looking at the kind of uh, issues that might sit on a title to a site and operate as legal constraints to development projects. So when you're giving your architect their, their red line to design into, you're, you're giving them something that's legally deliverable and where there are constraints, uh, how do we identify them? How can we overcome them or, or mitigate the risk? And then uh, number three is to focus specifically on the issue of rights to light. And, and that's where uh, Mark comes in and can lend us the benefits of his expertise. Uh, starting then to look at the, the comments in a state code on, on the new hospital programme about a title due diligence, I suppose, and, and a, a state code deals with it very, very briefly. Uh, it doesn't make a huge amount of reference to new developments generally, but in the context of acquisitions, it says there should be a check on the legal title and restrictive covenants that might prevent the proposed development. So it only talks about covenants in there. And then the new hospital programme have been issuing a checklist, as I'm sure uh, some of you are aware. And that has a question which says, has the legal title been checked? Are there any restrictive covenants that might prevent the proposed development? Then goes on to say ransom strips, etc. I think they have updated that checklist in the last week or so, and there's a couple of additional title queries. But yeah, clearly there's a recognition here that restrictive covenants might be an issue, but, it, but it's not just that. And I think it's important for trusts to understand that it, it's not just restrictive covenants that might inform what you can do on a particular site. Uh, and that brings us sort of to the most basic level, really, which is tenure. So if you've got a, a, a development that you're bringing forward, um, lots of trusts will say to us, well, it's it's on our it's on our own land. So, you know, there's no issue. It's really just a construction project. And for some trusts, that will be absolutely right. You'll, the trust will have its own site, which it will own freehold. And, and it will be um, free from development constraints and it can it can get on with putting putting whatever can physically be constructed on the site subject to planning. But for other trusts, their site is a a mixture of freehold and leasehold um, or some land might even be unregistered. And that's particularly for those estates that have been sort of bolted together over time. But it, it's possible that some long leasehold estate might have been added. It's possible that you've got a PFI where some of the some of the unbuilt upon land sits within the PFI. So the implications of understanding what's sitting beneath the hospital site or the development site from a tenure perspective um, are very important. If you do have leasehold land, then you need to understand how long is left on the lease. Does it does it have a term left that supports the investment that you're making? Um, and are there are there covenants within the lease that might restrict development in some way? So, for example, requirements to get the landlord's approval of plans or uh, covenants against use or certain types of development. So uh, uh, at the most basic level, I think it's not assuming that the trust within the hospital site can can do what it it likes and, and understanding what the tenure is that the trust is um, sitting on. And, and that applies not just to areas of construction, but also access routes, service runs, site compound areas, areas that are ancillary to or supporting the development. So certainly had one client who um, was looking at taking access to a new development over a, a road that they, they only had a lease of and a time limited lease. So that's problematic. Um, if you're planning site compound areas, are you putting them on freehold or are you putting them on leasehold? Now, the estates professionals on the call will probably be, be thinking this is this is very basic and obviously something they would think about. But 
if the project's being run out of the finance team or transformation team or elsewhere within within the trust. Um, these are the kind of things they might not think about as they're providing the architect with uh, with instructions or or working up concept designs. I've mentioned lastly renewal or, or enlargement. So if you do have leasehold estate, it might be that it's at a long enough term that you still think you can build on it or you can run your services through it. Uh, and it might be that it's within the land on tenants at 1954. So there's a, cons a possibility of renewing it at the end of the lease term. Well, renewal will will involve payment of a market rent if that happens. So you know you need to to think about what's going to to occur at the end of the lease. Um, some in some cases it can be possible to enlarge a lease into a freehold. Uh, that's quite unusual. But it but it's a possibility to deal with long leaseholds that the trust holds. Uh, so understanding the tenure is is sort of number one, I think, on the list. Um, we then come on to covenants, which, as you as you saw at the start, that's, a, that's something that the NHP and a state code have identified as being important to any any new development. So what's a covenant? Well, it's a it's an agreement in a deed between one party and another in the context of a uh, 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 land legal title to a development site, it normally arises where the land has been split in some way in the past. Covenants can be restrictive or positive. So an example of a positive covenant is to um, repair and maintain a fence uh, going forward. Uh, restrictive covenants obviously tend to be more an issue for developments. So an obligation on the trust not to build on a certain area of land, not to use a certain area of land for a purpose other than as um, you know a, a, a certain type of facility uh, and these these can operate as constraints on development so when you're designing a new facility it's very important to understand if there are covenants on the site which part of the site they affect and the scope of the covenant so what does it actually capture and are you likely to be in breach if you proceed in the way you'd like to and then there's a whole question about enforceability. So any covenant um, must have benefiting and burdened land. So the burdened land here in our example is, is the trust site. So if we're thinking that uh, the trust land is subject to a covenant not to build on a red area, for example, that would be the burdened land. Um, and then some other land in the vicinity will benefit from that covenant or will have originally benefited. The land registry aren't very helpful here because they don't record which land has the benefit of the covenant. So we have to go on a go on an exercise of trying to work out who's got the benefit. And sometimes that can be uh, very difficult. It may even be impossible to identify which land has now got the benefit of the covenant. Um, even if we can, there are some circumstances in which a restrictive covenant may no longer be enforceable. So it may be the benefiting land no longer derives any benefit from the covenant. It may be that the principle of fragmentation applies um, or at some point the two pieces of land have been in common ownership. So the covenant has effectively um, died and collapsed. So just because there's a covenant on the site doesn't mean that you can't proceed with your plans. It just means we need to have a, uh, a look at the enforceability of it, the scope of it. And then have a mitigation strategy and I've included there on the slide a number of things that can be done to uh, reduce the risk arising from a restrictive covenant. So the most common is insurance and in and in most cases I would say insurance is a suitable uh, mitigation strategy for a restrictive covenant. So in that example uh, you'll place an insurance policy if uh, a neighbour or third party complains about the breach of covenant, the insurer will deal with that claim, pay out any damages and indemnify the insured against the loss it suffers. Uh, it, it tends to be better where you've got no known beneficiary, um, so you don't know who's got the benefit, and it's definitely better where you've been through the planning process and there have been no objections to the development. Um, if there have been objections and the objections reference the covenants on the title, then it can be difficult to place insurance. Another strategy is express reliefs. So you might be wondering why there's a picture of Annick Castle in the top right hand corner. Um, and the, the answer to that is that uh, certain landowners have 
have the benefits of a lot of covenants. What one of those is the Duke of Northumberland. So you can negotiate express releases with landowners. And at one stage of my career, I had to go up to Annick Castle and have a negotiation with the Duke's representatives uh, in a in a sort of large room, a hall in that castle about releasing some restrictive covenants over a development site. Um, and our client ended up making a release payment uh, to the Duke of Northumberland um, to remove the covenants. So if you know who's got the benefits, you can pay them away uh, and then proceed to develop as you like. Another route available is to apply to the Lands Tribunal for modification or discharge of the covenants. So this is an application under what's known as Section 84 of the Law of Property Act. And it's on the basis that the covenants are um, well, they satisfy one of a number of grounds, so they might be obsolete, they might prevent a reasonable use of land, or they might not convey any benefit to the person who, who purports to have the benefit, and an application can be made to have them either changed or removed entirely. And I think what we've seen in the last few years is probably a, a leaning in the Lands Tribunal towards developers. So there was a case last year, HAE developments, in which there was a covenant not to erect any buildings on a piece of land and not to use them for any purpose other than as a house. And the tribunal discharged both of those covenants on the basis that the character of the neighbourhood had completely changed. It was now a residential uh, area and there was an acute need for housing in the local area. So modification or discharge is an option. You can also apply to court for a declaration that the covenant's unenforceable. Um, so I talked about enforceability earlier. There are some complex rules there uh, that, that, that that need to be applied, and you can ask the court to effectively clarify your interpret interpretation and make a declaration the covenant can't be enforced. And then finally, I've included appropriation because some people who are experienced in this area might be might, might be thinking perhaps, well, I, I know about all those other methods, but there is a, there is another one which is appropriation, where a local authority can. Um, basically CPO, the benefit of the covenant. Now that that's only going to be helpful if you've got a local authority partner involved in the project, but it can provide a useful threat to someone who's seeking to hold up an, a development because they have the benefit of a restrictive covenant. So there are options to deal with these things, but in the first instance, your design work needs to have regard to uh, any covenants that might be sitting on the land on which you're trying to build. Right, next I'll talk about easements. So I'm sure some of you know that an easement is a right that benefits a piece of land uh, over another piece of land. So here we're talking about an easement over the trust land. It's important to be aware that easements can be either expressly granted or they can be implied. So an easement that's expressly granted should be recorded at the land registry and you can check. And actually, we can do this sort of thing very quickly now using um, some quite clever software that we've got. But you can check very easily whether there are registered easements. So, for example, rights of way, drainage, surface media, rights of light, support, things that might be registered over the trust land. And where you're trying to get to is there's no point well, you, it would be unlawful to build a building over a right of way or to plan a development that's going to infringe rights that your neighbour is enjoying over your site. So this is a check that very definitely needs to be done. You may also have granted easements yourself within leases that you've granted of your estate. So uh, trusts routinely grant leases to uh, occupiers. Those occupiers will include rights of way to get to the property. They might include parking arrangements. They might include other other easements like use of shared spaces. And those need to be taken into account um, in, in looking at the development at red line and what you can do. And you may need to negotiate away some of those easements. Um, I think the more uh, dangerous and risky area is in relation to prescriptive easements. So easements can arise from long use and there are a number of ways that can happen three in fact uh, but the, the sort of rule of thumb i suppose is 20 years of use without secrecy force or permission so 
someone has been using a right like a right of way they've been walking across the trust site or driving across it to get somewhere for 20 years they haven't been hiding it they haven't been climbing over any fences or breaking any locks and they haven't had the trust permission um and there's been no significant interruption during that period then they may have a prescriptive right and uh, this is a really quite a difficult area the uh, law law reform committee described the legislation that underpins prescriptive easements as one of the worst drafted acts on the statute book it dates from 1832 so it's coming up to 200 years old but we've still got it the the implication for title due diligence on a development is that you need to look at the practical um, aspect of how the site's being used so are people using your hospital estate to get from a to b who are those people how often are they doing it do you need to put some signage up to give them consent are you sterilizing the site in some way that may become problematic in the future um, and then finally public rights of way so easements are about about your neighbours effectively getting getting from a to b or exercising a right of drainage or whatever it might be public rights of way about the public at large so do you have parts of your estate that are being used by dog walkers footballers anglers fishing and you know, whatever it might be um, if those people are doing it for 20 years then there may be a presumption that it's, the land has become highway or they may even be able to apply for the land to be treated as a town uh, town or village green um, so an analysis of who's using the site and what the implication of that might be I think can be helpful before you commence the design phase. Going on to a connected topic I wanted to talk about access so um, I think it's you know it's fair to, to assume that all access routes into the trust estate aren't, aren't, aren't always equal and you can't always assume that you can access your site from anywhere so that's not just a, a matter of planning, but it's a matter of property law as well. So um, normally it's sensible to check the extent of the adopted highway and how that abuts the trust site. Um, you need to check that there aren't any ransom strips, so pieces of land between the highway and the trust site that might stop you getting access, because if there are, that could give rise to a claim in damages for the uh, person that owns the ransom strip and the courts have set down a, a rough rule of thumb in a case called Stokes and Cambridge that the owner of the ransom strip might be entitled to up to a third of the value uplift and that's that's often used as a as a guide um, if you're accessing your site via a right of way so may, maybe not the main access, but maybe there's a rear access, a pedestrian access, which isn't from the public highway, but via a private road, then you need to understand the extent of that right of way. Is it at all times and for all purposes? Is it pedestrian? Is it vehicular? Um, and you can't assume that you can upgrade that in any way or start using it for a different purpose without the permission of the, the owner of that land. So we've certainly seen trust saying, well, we're going to reroute the main access through here. And then you look at it and you think, well, actually, you've only got a right of way over that road. You don't own it. It's not highway. So putting your main A&E access by that route is just not going to work. Um, so it, again, it's not a case of just giving the architect a red line and, and, and asking them to get on with the job uh, because the whole thing has to be done in the context of the underlying legal estate suggested also thinking about maintenance obligations for private access roads who's paying if you start running more traffic down a private road is that going to increase the burden and then also things like visibility displays you know you 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 can't assume your connections into the highway will be um will be the way they are now you need to include the land necessary to enhance or upgrade those perhaps do you own that uh, if you don't own that, can you get hold of that? So access is a, is a key area. And then last of all, before we delve into a bit more detail on, on rights to light, I was just going to touch on mines and minerals because um, often 
trusts ask us or, or, or other developer clients ask us to carry out a title review and mines and minerals might be reserved from the title. The general principle is that the owner of the land owns the airspace above it and they own uh, everything beneath it down to the centre of the earth. So there's a huge column of ownership, but um, it is possible for the mines and minerals ownership to be severed from the main title. <laughs> now, the implication of that is one that the, the mines and minerals could be worked from from the side or there might be rights to work from the surface, although that's quite unusual. unusual. Um, it, in general, that's a sort of theoretical right because it's it, not often economic to to work mines and minerals in this country, depending on, on what's beneath the land. But it has given rise to this sort of strange little cottage industry of claiming trespass to mines and minerals, meaning that if somebody else owns the mines and minerals but beneath your land, when you dig your foundations, they might come along and say, oh, um, you've, you've interfered with and trespassed on our mines and minerals, and we'd like some damages, please. And I've certainly been uh, involved in, in in cases like that and there are some mines and minerals owners who actively monitor, monitor planning permissions in order to um, bring or, or intimate trespass claims. So uh, it's a difficult claim to make out. Y you have to actually establish there'll be some interference with mines and minerals there that have some uh, value and one of the first things the um, the surface owner can do is do a survey to check what is beneath the ground. But if you have a title or part of a title that has mines and minerals reserved, it's not something that can safely be ignored depending on where you are and what the attitude of the owner of those mines and minerals is. It may be sensible to ensure, it may be sensible to try and negotiate a release um, and certainly for health schemes, we have had mines and mineral owners um, agree to release any rights that they've got. Um, or it may just be a case of identifying the risk and making sure that it's reported in a, in a risk register that somebody could come along and, and claim uh, a trespass in the future. But again, it's something to, to consider on that initial due diligence of what is the development site and what are the constraints that will apply um, so I've got a short checklist that I'll circulate after this session, um, which captures some of these points. And if you'd like to ask some questions, then I please do either type them in the chat or, or we can pick those up at the end. But what I'd really like to do now is to pass over to, to Mark. Um, and Mark's going to get into a bit more detail on rights to light, which is a really technical and interesting area. Thank you, James. OK. Just bear with me while I move to the next slide. Is that sharing OK? Yep, thanks, Mark. Got me good. OK, thanks very much. So uh, a quick 10, 15 minutes then on uh, rights of light uh, and separately daylight and sunlight. So order presentation, quick bit on uh, my experience and the team's experience, uh, then we will move on to rights of light, which is a private legal matter, and that is very separate to daylight sunlight, uh, which is a planning related matter. So some example projects there, uh, just thought it'd be nice to see a few that we've been working on. Uh, Leeds uh, General Infirmary there, which historically I've worked on with James. Um, Harrow Road, Elmfield Way there in West London, which is for the NHS property services. Um, and uh, I do quite a lot with those guys, in fact. And uh, yes, that's a site there uh, where I think they achieved a planning permission and sold that on to Westminster, um, which uh, was a good result uh, for them. Grace Ormond Street, that's a, a very live project at the moment for a uh, children's uh, rare diseases unit for uh, strong cancers and rare cancers. Uh, very proud to be working on that and we achieved planning permission for a very, very big building uh, earlier this year. You can see St Mary's Hospital, Paddington, huge site that we're currently working on, very live uh, also. Um, and you can see Edgeware Community Hospital there, tucked down on the right, which again is another NHS property services site. Um, 
there's a couple of sites there in the middle that are not NHS, of course, uh, London Olympia uh, and Wembley Masterplan, which are two major sites uh, in London. So the general theme there you'll see are that those sites are quite urban, uh, where you tend to find, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, issues more so with rights of light and sunlight like, compared to more rural areas. But having said that, uh, Northwood and Pinner Cottage Hospital there, for example, on the top right, uh, not quite a rural area, but more rural compared to the other sites on the screen. Uh, and we did come across some daylight sunlight issues there with uh, semi detached houses on the other side of the site. So that's a quick sort of uh, whip over there, as it were, of the sites that uh, we tend to work on. So let's start with rights of light then, which, as I say, is a private legal matter, um, so not connected with planning. Um, and as James says, uh, this is an easement. Um, we tend to find that most rights of lights are uh, through easements, uh, through rather prescription, uh, and that is 20 years use. So if a neighbouring property uh, looks to be over 20 years old and those apertures are over 20 years old, then it's reasonable to assume that there could be a prescriptive right to light. However, uh, that can be overridden by deeds and agreements, express documentation of which James has already mentioned uh, that could be on title, which could prevent uh, rights being uh, uh, claimed over an neighbouring site. Or indeed, there could be a deed profile, for example, which actually burdens the NHS site and you need your architect to, to, to draw a scheme uh, which sits within that deed profile, as it were. So it's important to check the title at the outset alongside uh, solicitors like James uh, to make sure that there's nothing on title that burdens the site. So if there is, how do we respond to that? But by far the most common way of prescription for rights to light or rights of light or ancient lights, as sometimes they're called, uh, is through 20 years use uh, um, there. There's also another way to uh, acquire rights uh, with a property that's less than 20 years old, uh, which is through what's called transferred rights. Uh, and that is where the rights transfer from the demolished building across to the new building, which could be less than 20 years old or it is less than 20 years old. Uh, and that is where the windows are in a similar fashion or they're built in a similar fashion to the old windows and the rights simply transfer across to the new. Now, you can lose those rights and uh, that is through interruption um, or abandonment. Abandonment is quite hard to prove. Uh, that's my understanding. Um, but one year interruption is what we usually work with because there's a mechanism called light obstruction notice, which can stop neighbouring rights uh, accruing. Um, and we'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, finally, to say that um, the right to light is connected to the window, the prescriptive right. And so with uh, NHS sites uh, which uh, have surrounding open fields or land or, 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 or the like surrounding with no buildings, there is no right to light to that open land. It's connected to the window or the opening, as I say. And just to quickly summarise the difference between rights of light and daylight and sunlight, a right to light is relevant to any type of neighbouring space, whether it's habitable or non-habitable. But the difference with daylight and sunlight for planning applications is that we tend to find that only residential receptors are relevant and commercial is usually scoped out uh, and non-habitable spaces can also be scoped out for planning application uh, and daylight and sunlight reports. OK, so that's a quick introduction to rights of light and the acquisition of rights of light. Um, we tend to get involved um, uh, in scoping um, uh, an assessment of rights of light. So we're presented with a site, a red line boundary from the client. Uh, perhaps an architect might be on board already. Uh, and the first thing we will want to do is the due diligence process alongside James, for example, understand whether there's any express documents that uh, could be relevant for the site. Uh, once that's established, then we'll also alongside that uh, work out whether the neighbouring properties are over 20 years or not. Um, and we will also uh, establish whether if some of those neighbouring properties, for example, are under 20 years old, can we serve light obstruction notices? Um, now, a light obstruction notice uh, is uh, a notice which can be served on a property uh, which is under 20 years old, um, and that can stop the property from accruing the rights of light, the prescriptive rights over the site. But you need to catch the neighbouring property in time and the usual time frame for that is you need to catch it before it hits 19 years in one day. OK, that's the, the usual time frame that's used. Some say 18 and one, uh, but 19 and one is what we tend to say. Now, that's great because if you serve that notice and it's successful, then you've stopped the neighbouring property acquiring the prescriptive right to light over the site. 
Now we've worked with NHS property services with good estate management here um, over the years uh, and this is something that we also did on the Harrow site that I showed you for them at the Harrow Road site um, and we serve notices we caught loads of properties in time um, and that was brilliant because when they offloaded that site to Westminster when they did their due diligence um, they were then you know they were aware of the light obstruction notice that had been served on the neighbours and what that meant was that they could scope those properties out from any scheme that they wanted to put on that site in the future and therefore no compensation payments etc so it's good estate management um, if you can um, make sure that you have notice served in time so then if we've established all the neighbouring property or some of the neighbouring properties uh, enjoy rights we'll then move on to creating 3d models of the site and assessing schemes so you can see the images uh, on the top there uh, the one on the left uh, with the existing site in red and then the proposed scheme in green to the right that's actually Hammersmith and Fulham Town Hall there their major development and their town hall um, and we will then assess the effects on the neighbours um, of the scheme compared to the existing condition and then which we'll come on to in a moment we will uh, write a report for the client setting out the uh, possible risks of those infringements of rights we may also work with the architect um, at an early stage um, producing what's known as a, an envelope or a jelly mold for a site and that's the image on the bottom there um, and that is perhaps before the architect has come up with a scheme uh, and the architect or the client uh, wants to see a jelly mold across the site uh, that uh, in effect creates a massing that doesn't infringe neighbouring rights. Uh, and then that can be taken by the architect and if a scheme fits within that envelope then great there should be no effects upon the neighbours of any substantial degree so uh, we tend to find that some clients quite like those at an early stage to get a feel for the overall massing but as you can see it's not a particularly pretty thing that we produce but it's certainly helpful for the architect to compare with their scheme okay so moving on to uh, our video here so we these 3d models that we use they're very quickly evolving um, and uh, many local authorities now use uh, area-wide modeling like this as you can see on screen um, and this is these are often used for quick assessments of sites um, uh, at an early stage using these type of models and you can get really quite detailed with them you can go into neighboring properties to look at the effects of the scheme here in blue just there on the south bank they are the schemes that we've assessed and you can put all sorts of information into these 3D models now, which can include, you know, sight lines across St Paul's, etc. Um, and you can quickly mass up in yellow their schemes on sites and get a feel for the type of massing that you can produce or come up with um, before infringing rights, for example. Um, and as you can see, you can do all sorts of things. You can walk around the city, different views, live data, as it were. So, yeah, these are quickly evolving, these models, uh, and, and a lot of local authorities are starting to use these to quickly assess schemes. So defining the rights of light risk, uh, once we've created that 3D model and assess the scheme against the baseline condition, we will assess the change in light within the neighbouring properties based on what's called the Waldron methodology. Now, rights of light dating back to 1832, as James has already said, with the prescription act is pretty old school. Uh, and also the methodology of light assessment is old school. Uh, as I say, based on Waldron, uh, early 1900s. I'm not gonna go into the detail on that, but that is of course being challenged these days because it is an old fashioned way of assessing the change in light within neighbouring properties. But even in a recent rights of light case, the judge did say that he felt that it is still a reasonable starting point to look at the wardroom analysis to try and understand the light loss to a neighbouring property. And you can see the image on the top there on the right, uh, that is a neighbouring property, the two neighbouring rooms there, two living rooms. Uh, and what the wardroom analysis does is it assesses the scheme to see how much uh, of the uh, uh, sufficient light has been taken away in the proposed condition. In that case, that is denoted by the hatch there in the room there. Um, so that is one way of assessment. There's more modern methods of assessment, which we're not going to go into detail today. That's called climate based daylight modelling. That hasn't been tested properly in court yet, um, but no doubt it will do uh, in the foreseeable future. And the bottom right there shows that type of analysis. It's much more detailed than the old school Waldron way. Uh, takes into account much more detailed information, reflections, etc., from neighbouring properties, which is also a big question as to whether that should be incorporated. Um, but that's for another day. So to define the risk, we will compare the existing and the proposed light conditions. Um, and 
it's quite difficult to define the risk in all honesty. Uh, at the end of the day, it's down to the facts and circumstance of the individual site, uh, and it's at the judge's discretion as to whether uh, the compensation or injunction, which we'll come on to a moment, should be awarded. But we will go by previous case law to uh, get a feel for our particular case. Um, there is a case called the Shelfer case, which sets out a series of tests, which are a good starting point to understand whether the infringement to light uh, is one that could be remedied through compensation and or uh, injunction. Um, the nature of use of a neighbouring property is important to understand. Um, and it's all very much about whether that impact upon light uh, is going to substantially change the use and enjoyment of that space. And that's what we're trying to establish, which, as you can imagine, is not a particularly easy task. So um, once we've done all of that analysis of the scheme uh, and we've considered um, whether we feel alongside with uh, solicitors, um, whether there could be uh, an infringement of rights and whether those infringements of rights uh, could be substantial, then we're trying to get to a point as to understanding what the remedy is or could potentially be uh, for that uh, infringement. Um, injunction uh, is um, the starting point if we do have a substantial impact upon light and an injunction uh, of which I'm sure you'll be aware is um, a quite a draconian situation where if that is awarded then the scheme would have to be amended uh, to ensure that the uh, impact upon light uh, is not occurring to a substantial degree and that could mean some quite substantial changes to the scheme. Um, compensation uh, could be awarded, damages in lieu of an injunction could be awarded um, and uh, that could be based on which James has already mentioned and um, profit related damages uh, and a third of the profit of the part of the scheme that infringes the rights could be the starting point for the compensation to the neighbour. But as I said earlier, it's down to the judge's discretion uh, uh, based on the facts and circumstances of the individual case as to whether it's injunction or compensation or indeed both. So risk mitigation to try and avoid all of that situation. Well, uh, it's good if we get involved at an early stage, even if it's just a high level preliminary assessment. Um, uh, and if we think at that point, OK, it, it's prudent now to move on to the more detailed testing, i.e. creating those 3D models that I showed you earlier. Uh, that could lead into then an assessment of the scheme if that's already been drawn by the architect. Or indeed, we could be looking at one of those cutback jelly mould situations uh, to help the uh, client's team understand um, the potential for the site um, uh, whilst avoiding uh, infringements of light. Um, risk mitigation could also be in the case uh, or in the form of light obstruction notices, which we already discussed, which can be an effective tool to stop rights occurring over a site. Um, uh, or uh, if you weighed that all up and you're thinking actually no we want to go forward with the scheme that infringes the rights because that's the only way to have a viable scheme then it could simply be a case that we need to approach the neighboring properties where there's an infringement of light to do a deal as it were negotiate with them uh, and and that is probably the best way to go about it to mitigate the risk completely uh, negotiate with neighbors uh, and seek a deed of release uh, for the infringement to, to rights. And I have to say, in 99% of cases, uh, when we approach neighbouring properties, um, deals are done uh, and any junctions are quite rare. Let's not forget that. Another way to mitigate the risk uh, is through rights of light insurance. Uh, and that insurance policy um, uh, may be on a what's called a proactive or wait and see basis. Uh, that it that means that the insurer will look at the rights of light report also weigh up the risk in their mind uh, and they may say right okay we're happy to insure but you still need to knock on the doors um to do deals with neighbors because there is a high risk of injunction if if you don't you know the conduct of the developer is really important here if we end up in court so we want to see you knocking on doors but we're happy to uh, ensure that in the background in case cost spiral etc uh, and you're covered um, at a certain cap with, with compensation as it were uh, uh, which is called an excess um, the insurer may actually say well do you know what we don't want you to knock on doors we're happy to insure this on a wait and see basis in effect brushing it under the carpet um, and we don't want you to poke the bear as it were and we're happy to insure but that can be quite a risky situation um, uh, if you've got some very high impacts on neighbours in a dense urban area and a sensitive site and a sensitive group of neighbours uh, and I can't imagine the insurer would be happy to, to, to insure on that basis in any event in that sort of situation. 
Finally, section 203, which is more James, you know, your team's bag, of course. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail on this, but this is similar to CPO uh, and in qu quite an important uh, mechanism actually to uh, reducing risk on sites. Uh, Section 203 of the Housing and Planning Act uh, in effect would wipe out neighbouring rights, uh, including uh, rights of light, uh, and reduce those to a compensatable interest. Uh, so it removes the risk of injunction um, uh, and compensation uh, would not be through a profit related way. It would be about diminution in value to neighbouring properties, which is quite hard to determine uh, for sites, uh, you know, which could be built uh, many years ahead. So that could materially reduce the risk. Uh, and Section 203 is for tends to be for important sites in the country um, where uh, it's important that that scheme goes forward uh, in the public interest. Uh, but it's quite a complicated situation where the council would have to take an interest in the land, et cetera, and go through the sort of CPO type process. Uh, but for hospital sites where there are, you know, in the more denser locations where there's widespread injuries to neighbouring properties that could, uh, that really do present a risk, Section 203, uh, it could be quite an important consideration. OK, so that was rights of light, so you can get all of that out of your mind now because daylight sunlight for planning is a completely separate methodology. We're not going to spend too much time on it because it's not a, it, it is not a legal matter, um, but it's still quite an important consideration. It's usually looked at alongside rights of light. Um, so daylight sunlight planning related um, uh, councils would usually want to see a daylight sunlight report where there could be daylight sunlight effects upon neighbours. Um, the BRE guidelines there you can see is the document that most councils tend to refer to in terms of assessing daylight sunlight effects on neighbours and indeed light within uh, proposed schemes. Um, and we'd go through a similar process to rights of light really, scoping the neighbouring properties, which ones should we assess? Um, and uh, if there's a scheme uh, that's already been drawn by the architect, we would assess the impacts of that scheme on the neighbouring properties or create a jelly mould for the architect to establish how much massing they can get on the site before impacting the neighbouring properties to a point where perhaps that might be unacceptable in planning terms. Um, BRE guidelines for daylight sunlight, uh, they're not mandatory, uh, they're not planning policy and the guidance in there should be applied flexibly because they can be applied across the whole of the country. Uh, uh, and clearly the daylight conditions are going to be different in an urban location compared to suburbia. So flexibility is important with the BRE guidelines. It sets out various tests for assessing daylight sunlight on neighbours, including shadow. And you can see the image on the bottom right there. And that's an image of all the sun that's achieved in that particular scheme there uh, in uh, West London. In effect, the BRE says that if there is more than a 20% loss of existing daylight sunlight levels, then that loss will be notable to the neighbouring occupants. But it doesn't say that's unacceptable. That's down to the council to make that judgment. Risk mitigation for daylight and sunlight, as I've mentioned already earlier, um, we could produce those uh, jelly moulds for the client team. And if uh, the scheme sits within that general great because uh, that would mean that there would be uh, no material impacts on the neighbours. Uh, uh, so uh, the other way we should look at this is that um, you could amend the scheme. We could produce some cutbacks to the scheme. Maybe the top needs to be set back a bit to avoid that material impact upon a neighbour. Job done. I think it's important to understand here that the difference here with daylight sunlight uh, to rights of light is that you can't simply pay off the neighbours in daylight planning terms, whereas with rights of light, for want of a better phrase, you can pay off the neighbours if the money is right in most cases. Um, just quickly there, comparable evidence, if you do have a situation where your scheme, uh, and we do have this particularly with NHS schemes in central London health centres in more urban locations where it's inevitable that there's going to be breaches of the BRE guidance, then uh, if that's what's submitted, then we'll probably want to put forward comparable evidence to say, well, look, you know, here are the breaches. We accept there's breaches, but there's also been breaches elsewhere uh, and precedent has arguably been set, although it is a different case here. Uh, with the particular site, but comparative evidence we find tends to be helpful uh, in arguing the case uh, for um, planning permission to be granted. OK. And back over to you, James. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks so much for that, Mark. It's really, really interesting. Um, so my session was really about thinking in 2D 
and yeah, you, you've got a red line and what can you do within that and um, what legal issues might impact what you can do in it. But but Mark is obviously thinking in, in 3D to create this sort of development envelope in, in built up um, urban areas. So that's that's quite important. So I hope that whole session has, has been useful for people. I mean, it, it's sort of, it, it, I was thinking, Really about how the idea came about, and it, 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 I remember when I was when I was a trainee, and my supervisor and I were working on a development project, and the architect had designed something that didn't fit within, didn't physically fit within the red line that the client owned, and he said something to me along the lines of, "Well, architects don't don't let the law ruin a good design. Uh, you know, once they get going, they'll create something that um, looks attractive and, uh, you, you know, is." is suitable for the client's purposes but these kind of issues uh, need to be fed into them so that they can create something that's actually uh, legally deliverable not just physically deliverable and so clients will often do feasibility studies on the site and will have to as part of the planning process but uh, that that legal deliverability piece for 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 some schemes not not everything some things are so straightforward and on, on land you own and clearly have owned for years that you don't need to think about it too much but um certainly uh, something novel on a part of the site you've never developed on before or land that you're acquiring i think it's it's very much worth thinking about these things at an, an early stage um so we've got about nine minutes left uh it'd be it'd be great if if anyone's got any questions um you know just just raise your hand i think that's probably how we're doing it and come off mute and, and fire away um if not i've got i've got a question for mark but <laughs> uh, let's see if we've got any questions from the audience first no that's that's fine um yeah no problem so mark, mark i was just gonna ask you one question the time we've got available which is just just around the profit element of damages so uh, when you've got an nhs scheme um thanks lee for that comment when you've got an nhs scheme presumably it's quite hard to assess what the sort of profit and damages would be because um the nhs are developing as a public a public benefit i don't know if you've had to tackle that uh, yeah or, or not <laughs> That is a very, very difficult question, and we try to avoid if we've got neighbours uh, going for profit on a nature site, then we simply turn around and say that that you well try and prove that then. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, I'm not a valuer, uh, land valuer, but I have heard that well, perhaps it's about the land value pre and post development, and and, and that's way over my my remit. But um, so I've heard that there can be arguments, but I've not seen it in the what, the 18 years I've been doing this, I've not seen that be pushed on an nhs site uh, it's mm. just too complicated and it just doesn't stack up by the seams of things um i, I know that there's uh, there's a kc top kc in rights of light who's currently questioning or trying to put forward the notion you know what is profit related damages in a rights of light context and you know this doesn't quite stack up uh, and it should go back to perhaps the traditional method which is not based on profit um, but i i need to understand more on that with that Casey as to how he's he's pushing that notion forward. Mm, yeah, because you would think that, you know, something that's being developed out of the public person isn't making any profit, shouldn't really attract any damages, but then there's no compensation there for the person who's suffering the injury. So yeah, who, who is actually losing something they've been enjoying for years. Um, yeah, so that's quite, quite interesting. Well, if there's no other questions, then um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll we'll wrap up. I think Mark, if you just flick onto the next slide, I think our yep. contact details are are there. Um, at, and I think we'll send that we will we'll be sending the slides around and the recording for anyone who didn't catch all of it. Um, and yeah, no, really, thank you for dialing in, and I hope I hope you all have um productive the rest of your days. And yeah, speak to you soon. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.